Can you folks hear me? I'd like to, on behalf of the Dolan Lecture Committee, invite all of you to Dolan Lecture number 13. In case anyone here is not familiar with Dr. Dolan, and I see a lot of people with white coats on, we have quite a, a, a bio of him in the program, which I hope you will read. Uh, and I would comment that what you see here uh, this auditorium is just one facet of all of the things that Dr. Dolan did for this institution and this community. Most, particularly in the field of medical education, that was his devotion, and uh, he did it, and we're all very proud of him. Uh, we have a lecture committee, and I'd like to recognize the, my fellows on the lecture committee. Uh, John Dolan is here. Uh, Pat Carrenti, Larry Gatos, Don Nolan, and Bob Ryan. They've all uh, put a lot of time in over the years to carry these lectures off. Dr. Bill Dolan's family is well represented here this evening. We have Bill and Jeff Dolan and their daughter Kathleen and son Tom. Uh, a comment about Tom. Despite Alan Greenspan, I think Tom is going to bring this country back on the gold standard. <laughs> We're very proud of you, Tom. And John and Carol Dolan, welcome. Uh, the format for this evening lecture is as follows. Dr. Crystal will deliver his lecture with no interruptions for questions. At the conclusion, he will entertain any and all questions. Forgive me if I sound like Jim Lear, but that's the way it's going to be. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patrick Carrenti, who will in turn introduce our speaker. One moment of reflection. 25 of people of the Arlington family, physicians, nurses, support group, the president, they are in Honduras this very evening caring for those unfortunate folks who do not have regular medical care. And I hope this evening you will remember in your prayers that they come home healthy and safe from their, from their journey. Patrick? It's a pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker. Uh, when we sat down in January to discuss topics for the upcoming Dolan Lecture, we had looked at topics that we haven't looked at in the past, and a pulmonary topic came to mind. And Dr. Haggerty, for the last few years, has really been hot on the topic of gene therapy. So after our meeting, I called Dr. Casolaro, our chief of medicine here, and asked him you know, if he had any ideas. And without hesitation, Dr. Casolaro said, you've got to get this guy down here from New York. He's a phenomenal speaker. He's the father of bronchial alveolar lavage, and he's the guru of cystic fibrosis. Well, I figured if we got that much excitement out of Castellero, we really needed to get this guy here. <laughs> it's a pleasure uh, to welcome back Dr. Crystal to the Washington metro area. <clears throat> Dr. Crystal was born in New Jersey. He did his undergraduate work at Tufts, then his uh, graduate work in physics at University of Pennsylvania. He then stayed at University of Pennsylvania to do his medical degree. He soon became the chief of pulmonary medicine at NIH and along with teaching genetics at GW University. He has a distinguished career with over 40 lecturers where he was the honorary lecturer. He has spoken for the American College of Chest Physicians, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and the Society of Thoracic Radiology. He's on the editorial board for Clinical Cancer Research, International Journal of Biochemistry and Cell Biology, Transplantation, and Gene Therapy. In 1993, he went up to New York to Cornell University and became the chief of pulmonary medicine there. He's also the director of gene therapy and also the director of the Institute for Genetic Medicine at the Weill Medical College at Cornell. It's an honor to introduce Dr. Ronald Crystal to discuss medicine in the millennium using genetic medicine to regenerate diseased organs.
thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, fun to see old friends like Tony Casolaro. And uh, I also appreciate it because I live in two places, so it's a chance to get home to see my family. Uh, and my son, who's a junior at, uh, at, at Landon School in, in, in Bethesda. Well, what I would like to do is to give you an, an overview of what I see, at least, for where medicine is going. And from everything I heard about uh, Dr. Dolan, I'm sure that he would be... Uh, that turn on? Sorry. Uh, Dr. Dolan would be right in the forefront of, of that. And I'm really honored to, to be here, and I appreciate not only the committee, but the Dolan family for, for giving me this, this honor. As you all know, in, in the last, uh, I guess when, around the time that I came to NIH, just before that, the, the genetic code was broken, and the, the last 30 years in medicine has been an extraordinary time. We're now on all of our PCs, on our desks. We have the human genome, the 100,000 genes that make us up uh, as humans. And what I'd like to talk about is how we might use those genes as medicines uh, for the future. A little bit of an introduction. First, a little history. Ponce de Leon, a 15th century um, explorer, uh, as you know, uh, discovered Florida. But he really was looking for what, something that was de described in the Bible, the fountain of, of youth, and that if you bathed or drank its waters, theoretically would restore uh, youth. And that's really the concept that I want to talk about uh, is the idea of genetic medicine. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, because um, I've been interested for many years in athletic pursuits. Unlike the Dolan family that have the right genes, my family doesn't. And although I fantasize, this is uh, not this year, last year's uh, Boston Marathon, I fantasize of crossing uh, the finish line at the Boston Marathon in some reasonable time. Uh, in fact, I have worked years at it and not done very well. So actually, this is me uh, crossing the finish line at the Boston Marathon, and that's not really my time. Um, that's, my <laughs> that's my fantasy, because what separates the real runners from the, uh, uh, from the rest of the pack, at least for us amateur runners, is three hours. And I've worked very, very hard in terms of trying to do that. And since there's many in the audience who are, who are docs, and docs always like to see data, let me show you what the problem is, and you'll see where I'm going with this. These are my Boston Marathon times. And it's plotted as a function of years. And I ran 13 times between 78 and 90. And here's my time. And here's my goal at three hours. So I started off not very well. And I reached my best about a 310 or so. And then it didn't matter what I did. I lost weight. I'd run more miles. I'd go up hills. I would do any. It didn't matter what I did. Inexorably, my times increased. And my times increased because I'm getting older. And so that's really the concept that I, I want to talk about, is what can we do of using genetic medicine to be able to deal with problems that we all have as we get older? And the concept is in terms of gene therapy. Now, the idea really is not very difficult. We have genes that we can isolate, and we want to use them as drugs. And so we want to try to change the genetic repertoire of a cell either for within the cell, in the local area around the cell, or systemically within the body. So that's really the basic concept. Now, gene therapy started out, when we, uh, those of us who started, were early in the field, we started thinking about gene therapy in the mid-1980s, and we really thought about hereditary disorders. That is, the genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia and, and others. In fact, what's happened in the gene therapy field is we all soon realized that it was very applicable to the acquired disorders as well, which, of course, are much more common. There basically are two ways to do gene therapy. And you might want to turn the lights down just a little bit, so the slides will probably show up a little better. There's basically two ways to do gene therapy. There is so-called ex vivo and in vivo. Gene therapy started, the first human gene therapy, was uh, about a decade ago now when French Anderson and Mike Blaze at NIH treated a, a disease called adenosine deaminase deficiency, a very rare genetic disease. And this is the boy in the bubble disease. This is uh, where children 
who their immune system, because of genetic abnormalities, cannot protect them against uh, various bacteria and viruses, and so they have to be put in a plastic bubble, essentially, to survive. And what they did was they took uh, immune cells, T lymphocytes, from the two children. They modified them genetically in the test tube, the, the cells, grew up the cells, and infused them back to these children. That's a strategy of ex vivo. The genetic manipulation is done in the test tube. But when we started thinking about it, because uh, we, were, we were pulmonary doctors, we started thinking about how could we treat the lung? We well, can't take the lung out and fool around with the test tube for a week, and you can't do that with the heart or the brain. And so we started thinking about in vivo gene therapy. That is putting the genes directly into the individual uh, uh, without taking out any cells. So the concept is as follows. And so think about the human genome, all of our genes, like a bag of M&Ms. And so here we have all the M&Ms, that's our, our genes, and we pick out those M&Ms that are the particular gene we're interested in, the therapeutic gene. And then we have to figure out a way to deliver it, so we put it in a truck of some kind, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. And we have our delivery vehicle with our genes, and we deliver it to here our sick cell, which is our sick house, and that our target organ now becomes happy and, and well. That's the whole theory, and of course that's what we, we want to do with it all. Now, in more technical terms, what we, we're trying to do is to take a gene and deliver it to a cell. And the idea is we put it in the context of what we refer to as a vector. And I'll come to that in just a moment. That is our delivery vehicle. We then take our gene in our delivery vehicle and we try to get it to the cell. And although our group and others work very hard at trying to, to develop these gene therapy delivery ve vectors so we could just inject them and they go to one organ versus another. In fact, as I'll show you, the way we really do it is we inject it directly into the organ of, of interest. Once it gets to the cell, we have to have it bind to the outside of the cell and then go inside the cell. And the cell, if you're the size of a gene, in fact, is a huge distance. It's like, uh, let's say, being in Baltimore and trying to find this hospital. And that's not easy. And so we have to direct it, and the jargon is translocation, to get to the nucleus, where, of course, the other genes are, where there it uses the usual genetic machinery to express our new gene. And of course, like any drug, we have to do this with limited toxicity. So now let me talk about the vectors. Now I got here today, as I got in a car, went to LaGuardia, got in a plane, got here, got in a car. And, and, and came here, and those were my transportation vehicles. Well, in the same way in gene therapy, we have transportation uh, vehicles, and it's not a bus or a truck or a taxi cab or a plane. We use viruses or pieces of lipid or a variety of strategies that will take our gene and deliver it to exactly where we want it to go within the cell. And if you go to a gene therapy meeting, you basically, there's two kinds of, of scientific sessions, viral and non-viral. The viral strategies of delivering genes realize that viruses live only to reproduce themselves. And so viruses are really smart guys, and what viruses have figured out to do is how to deliver their genetic machinery to the nucleus so they can reproduce themselves. They, they basically instruct the cell to make the virus instead of, 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 of what the cell does. So what we do if we use viruses for gene therapy is we hijack the virus. We turn it into a Trojan horse. We take out the genes out of the virus that allows the virus to reproduce itself, and we slip in the gene that we want to deliver directly to the cell. That's the idea. But there's a whole different philosophy in gene therapy, which is the non-viral approach. The non-viral approach says, well, that's great to use viruses, but after all, just like the idea is you get a cold and then uh, you develop immunity against that virus. And if you try, somebody sneezes on you with the same cold, you won't get the cold the second time because there are host defenses against viruses. And it'll be a lot easier to try to figure out how to deliver these genes by artificial means. And those are the non-viral systems. The problem with that strategy is just like think of yourself in Baltimore and somebody says, come to the Arlington Hospital, but doesn't give you directions. Well, that's like a gene being outside of a cell trying to get to the nucleus. has no idea how to get there. And the way you, you would do it, in the, the way they do it in the non-viral systems, is they use large numbers of genes, and one randomly may get to the right place. 
And so if you just take a gene and put it outside a cell, it takes about 10,000 genes for one to get to the nucleus. In contrast, if you use an adenovirus, which is a cold virus, which is the virus we use for most of our studies, you only need two, and one will get the genetic information directly to the nucleus. So that's basically the concept, and these are the vehicles. The ones above the top ones are the non-viral approaches, and the ones below are the viral approaches, and these all actually have been used in humans to deliver genes. You can use naked DNA, which in the jargon is referred to a plasmid. It's a double-stranded circular piece of DNA. You can use that for your gene. Or you can take the plasmid and associate it with a lipid droplet, and that's a liposome. And those have been used in human studies. It's very inefficient. And so those have been used primarily for vaccine studies, so developing vaccines, genetic vaccines, against infectious disorders, or in some cases, for cancer. The ones below are the viruses that have been used. We, we tend to use adenovirus, one of the cold viruses. There is adeno-associated virus, which is a small parvovirus, and which is very effective at, at, at putting genes into the muscle, the eye, the brain, uh, the liver. The problem with the, the adeno-associated virus is, as you can see, it's very small compared to the adenovirus, so its cargo space for genes is small. It will only hold 4,500 base pairs of DNA, in contrast to the adenovirus, which will hold 36,000 base pairs. The third strategy is with a retrovirus, an RNA virus, in the same way that the HIV virus is, a, is an RNA virus. But what's used in the gene therapy field is a mouse virus, the, the Maloney murine leukemia virus, that's been engineered so it can't, can't, can't cause any harm in humans. And you put your gene in that, and the RNA is converted to DNA, and that gets delivered to the nucleus. This works only in cells that are reproducing themselves, so it works best ex vivo and particularly with hematologic cells. These work in vivo. Adenovirus is without question the, the star of all the viruses in the terms it's the most effective, but it only lasts for about a week. Adeno-associated virus lasts for a much longer period of time, but you don't get the same level of expression. And this is what the adenovirus looks like, and I'm going to use this for two examples for you. So what we do is we take this virus, and it has this protein coat, and it has these spikes coming off it, and the spikes are how it interacts with the cell. And we take apart the virus, we engineer the, the uh, DNA within the virus, take out the bad parts, the parts that allow it to rip, rip, reproduce itself, and we slip in whatever our gene is of interest, together with appropriate controlling region to allow it to turn on. And this is how it gets from outside the cell to inside the cell, how, how it gets from Baltimore to the Arlington Hospital. Here's the cell surface. Here's the nucleus where we want to get. It binds with one of those spikes with a specific receptor. <clears throat> Turns out that the adenovirus receptor is the same as the Coxsackie B virus receptor, so it's called CAR, Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. It binds tightly to that. And then there's another cell surface, um, a, a group of proteins called integrins, and that is the signal to internalize the virus and it's brought into the cell. Once it comes into the cell, it's taken up like anything taken up in a cell in an endosome, and the virus has some machinery to break out of the endosome. So it breaks out of this little bubble, and then it travels along microtubules in the cell. And my analogy to that is known um, in New York is like the subway, and the virus sort of gets onto the microtubules like a subway car, and it goes along the microtubules directly to the nucleus. It binds to the nucleus and squirts out its genetic information that goes through a nuclear pore into the, into the nucleus. And it doesn't go inside the, your own uh, chromosomes. It works outside of the chromosomes, but uses the same genetic machinery to, to uh, express the genes. So let me show you that it works. And the way I'm going to show you it works is with a reporter gene. And so we're going to use a gene that codes for a gene which is made by bacteria called beta-galactosidase. And gene therapy doctors like that to show examples in animals because there's a convenient stain for beta-galactosidase that stains things blue. So the experiment is we take the blue gene, that is the beta-galactosidase gene, we put it inside an adenovirus, and we're going to put the adenovirus now down the lung of a rat. And we're going to take one of his buddies and not do anything. And one week later, we will take out the lungs, of, we'll sacrifice the animals, 
take out the lungs of both animals, and stain for this gene the, the beta-galactosidase gene. And that was the experiment, and this is the result. So here's the control. That's a normal lung here. That's the guy who didn't get the adenovirus with the beta-galactosidase. And here in this blue lung here is, is the, for, from the rat that was infected with the adenovirus with the blue gene. So there's no question that we can genetically change and enter the cells of an internal organ. And it was with that that led us to studies in, in cystic fibrosis and, and uh, the, the gene therapy that we did with cystic fibrosis. But I thought instead of talking about that today, I thought I would show a couple of different examples that, that perhaps you haven't seen and, and might be of interest to you. The concept that I want to use is the idea of embryonic switch genes. If you think of a, of a baby when, in, in, when, when the baby's an embryo and is making something like its coronary arteries, it must turn on genes for a period of time, turn off genes, turn on other genes. And so this gene expression that goes on when we're building our bodies as embryos must be in the context of fairly short terms expression. And so that's the idea. We're going to use genes that are these master switch genes that turn things on to build structures when we're embryos. So we're going to use these embryonic switch genes to initiate a cascade of tissue growth. And it only requires local transient expression. And that's why the adenovirus as a delivery system is very, very good. And so that's the system that we're going to use. And this is the first example I'm going to show you. So this is my example of getting older. As you can see, I'm losing my hair. And so I've been interested, and my colleagues and say, can we do something about it? Now, we haven't done this in humans. My first example would be in mice. My second example, I'll show you something in humans. But I thought it shows the dramatic um, uh, power of this technology. And so I thought you'd be interested in that. So this is a common medical problem. Now, it turns out, I didn't, before we got into this work a couple years ago, I knew nothing about hair. It turns out hair is really interesting. You are born with 100,000 hair follicles, men and women. And once you're born, that's it. You don't get any more hair follicles. What your hair follicles do when you get older is they cycle. And they cycle over a period of about four years. That's why young teenage women sometimes let their hair grow, and it grows all the way down to about their waist and doesn't get any longer. That's because it takes about that long for four years to grow your hair. Now, the, it's asynchronous in, in humans. That is, the hair follicles have a different, all have different cycles, and so you don't realize that the hair is falling out and, and, and so on. So the, our hair is cycling, and in fact, those of us who are, ha are hair follicle challenged, like me, in fact, we have our hair follicles. They get stuck in male pattern baldness. They're stuck in one phase of the hair, hair cycle. And this is what your hair follicles look like. The hair follicles, so if you look on, on the right-hand side, this is the resting stage. Here's your skin. It evaginates down. That's the hair follicle, and then comes out. And so this is the follicle, and this is the erector pili muscle. That's what makes your hair stand on end. And it is connected to a part of the hair follicle. All these cells is called the bulge region, because it's sort of fat. And that's where the stem cells are that proliferate. And when the hair follicle starts growing, it grows down. And that's called the antigen phase, which is the growth phase. And as it grows down, the keratinocytes, the cells that are, are lining it, also grow in. And as they grow in, they die and form the hair shaft, which grows up and out. And so that's what occurs during the growth phase. And then after the, this, the cycle is complete, it goes through the middle phase, the catagen phase. And these cells undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis. And, and it involutes, and then it goes through the cycle again. The problem with male pattern baldness is it's stuck right there. It can't go. So my colleagues and I started thinking about, well, we know that it'd be tough to make new hair follicles, but can we make hair follicles go through the cycle faster? That would be the idea. Right. So that's the experiment I'm going to show you. Also, what, 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 um, the reason I wanted to use this example, it shows the power of genes in terms of what genes can go wrong if you don't have enough genes, what can go wrong if you have too much genes, and what can be terrific if you have just right, the right kind of genes. And the gene I want to tell you about is the sonic hedgehog gene. It was the first identified in fruit flies, Drosophila. And it was found that this gene, the Drosophila, the fruit fly embryo, looked like a hedgehog, you know, the little animal that curls up with the spines coming, coming off. 
And so hence it was uh, called the hedgehog gene. And though for those of you who are not in the medical profession, if you think that we really do, you know, we're really smart guys, the name Sonic Hedgehog came because the scientist who, who finally cloned this gene in a mouse like the Sega game, Sonic Hedgehog, and hence the name Sonic Hedgehog. And well, it turns out this, this, this gene actually was really thought about a long, long time ago by Homer. And for those of you who remember the, the, uh, the Odyssey, that um, what happened was Ulysses, part of the Odyssey, is that Ulysses and his buddies land on this island of Cyclops. And what they encounter in, Cy in, in, in the island of Cyclops are these really bad guys who have one eye, who are giants, who are cannibals. They ate a bunch of Ulysses' uh, men. And it's a pr actually, if you, I went back and read it. Um, I probably never read it when I was in high school. And, and uh, it's really pretty violent. I mean, we think that thing in children's things that, I mean, you read, you re you read uh, this stuff, and you know, they got um, uh, Polyphemus, who was the chief uh, Cyclops, they got him drunk, and they put their spears into, the, uh, into the, in the fire, and they stuck it in his eye, and they escaped. Well, it turns out that there really are kids with cyc cyclopia. They don't survive, and these are two human uh, fetuses with cyclopia. It turns out it's caused by mutations of the sonic hedgehog gene. This gene is involved with the splitting of our brains into two when we are embryos, and the splitting of our eyes. And if you have mutations in this gene, you get one eye, and of course you don't survive. But there actually are some mild mutations of this gene where humans grow up and they're absolutely normal, and they have one front tooth, because the, front, the two teeth have to split as well. Interesting. So you say, why are you interested in this gene? Well, it turns out that this gene also is expressed in hair follicles, and it's very involved in terms of hair follicle growth. It's expressed in cells associated with developing embryonic hair follicles. And if you do transgenic mice, that is mice where you put in the gene and you overexpress it uh, in the skin, they have hyperproliferation of the cells of the of skin and the hair follicles. And in fact, they can develop cancers of the hair follicles. And if you knock out this gene in a mouse, they don't develop mature hair follicles. So we thought, ah, if we transiently express this gene in the skin, could we accelerate the development of the hair cycle? That's, that's basically the idea. So here's the first experiment. We take a mouse, that's a C57 black six mouse, and we chose a black mouse because we knew that hair is black because of melanin, and we thought it would be easy to see on histologic sections. And we made an adenovirus gene transfer vector expressing the sonic hedgehog gene. We inject it into the skin of the mouse, and one week later, we looked at the site of ejection for the development of melanogenesis, that is the development of the, of the blackness from the hair. And these are unstained histologic specimens. So here's the top of the skin here, here's the bottom, that's the skin. And it's unstained, so you really see very little melanin. But look in the, in the, in the animal, that's the control. The animal injected with the sonic hedgehog, the skin is thicker, that's what happens when the follicles are growing, and you see all these black sort of things? That's the melanin. So I said, ah, we're getting somewhere. And so then we said, can we really make hair grow faster? This, without question, I think, is the most creative thing that I've ever done. Not because of the gene therapy, but rather it's the following problem. Is think about if you have a black mouse, that's black because it has black hair, how do you prove that you're growing hair faster in a black mouse? I actually thought about this for months and months, and we couldn't come up with a good way to do it. And so and i got to be politically correct in terms of how I tell the story. It's absolutely true. I was walking outside the hospital. I saw an individual who hadn't been to the beauty parlor. And, it, and I realized that the roots were a different color. And I said, ah. And I ran back to the lab, and I said to my postdoctoral fellow, go to the local beauty salon and get some blonde hair dye. So this is probably the only example you'll ever see of a Clairol bleach blonde mouse. <laughs> and so what we did was we took our mouse, our black mouse, and we injected either a control virus, or the, uh, what we call null virus, or a sonic hedgehog adenovirus. And then five days later, we took the mouse and we bleached blonde. We didn't bleach his head, as you can see. So here's our bleach blonde mouse, and here's our regular black mouse as a control. And then we clipped his hair after seven, 14 days, and then we just looked. And the idea was that on this blonde background, if the hair, grew, if the hair follicles were growing faster, that we would see blackness in this blonde background. Okay, that was the idea. So here is the mice one week later. And as here, uh, each is a pair with a control. And you see that black spot? 
That's the area that we injected it. We said, ah, we're getting somewhere. And so we followed them for another week, and we saw this. So we said, hey, we really can grow hair. And this is a, one of our, our, our mice. This was in the New York Times, in the science section of the Times. And not working in the field, I'm not a dermatologist, and I, so I never, I don't know anything about baldness. I didn't realize how important it is in the world. It, this showed up, this is one year ago when the article appeared and it was published, and the article appeared, and Nick Way in the New York Times published an article, wrote an article about it. It was picked up by this, all these baldness websites. I still get two to three emails a week from bald men all over the world who send me pictures of their heads and say, please, I don't care whether it's approved or not, I want it. <laughs> so. Well, we haven't done the clinical studies, and, and there clearly is an issue in terms of, you know, is it appropriate to use gene therapy for things like, which, uh, you know, is, is, is essentially um, a beauty-related thing. But there is a very important problem in, in medicine that's related to baldness, and that's this. This is a woman with metastatic breast carcinoma who has received chemotherapy. And when you think about it, is that the fact that she has breast cancer is something between her, her family, her doctor, until she takes chemotherapy, and then everybody knows about it. In fact, there are many articles written about this, the, the psychology of this, and women often will make a decision not to do chemotherapy because of this very issue. And, so we, and, and the, the kinds of, of chemotherapy like uh, doxyrubicin, cyclophosphamide, Taxolv and Kristen are the kinds of chemotherapies that, that cause this. And so we've been thinking seriously because she has her hair follicles. It'll grow back. It just takes six months to a year. And so if we could accelerate that, we've now done studies in mice uh, where we have used chemotherapy and their hair falls out, and we can accelerate it, at least in a mouse. And so if you're a mouse, we can make your hair grow faster. Whether it'll work in humans or not, I don't know. So let me use the Fernandez example. Let me turn in terms of humans. Can we use gene therapy in terms of humans? And I'm going to show you an example of that. But before I do that, I thought, because there has been a lot of media uh, things relating, particularly in the past year, because there was a death related to gene therapy at the University of Pennsylvania. And you've probably read a good deal about that uh, in, in the papers. Uh, I thought you'd be interested a little bit in the, in the sort of uh, that, those aspects of it. Well, it turns out gene therapy and the fears about gene therapy are not new. This is a cartoon from the 19th century about Jenner, who, of course, developed the, the vaccination for smallpox using cowpox. This was a cartoon of Jenner administering the cowpox virus to the population. Here's Jenner, and here's the population. So he's administering a cowpox virus, of course, has different genes than human, to humans. And as you can see, all these guys in this clinic, we see all have cows coming out of all their orifices. So the idea that gene therapy, if you will, they didn't call it then, was something scary for the population was certainly is not new. And I think that's why people are worried about it. If you think about it, for example, 25 years ago, there were a lot of ethical concerns about in vitro fertilization. And today you can go into clinics and you can say, I want the father to have blonde hair and be a lawyer and whatever you want. I mean, that, that's accepted by society. I think for genes, we're worried about it because we don't know about it. And we're not only worried about it in terms of humans, we're worried about it for our tomatoes. You read about them, Frito-Lay, you read all about the withdrawal of the corn just recently. And in it, human gene therapy is nothing compared to that. And the reason, in terms of our society, is that if you put a gene in a tomato or corn, the problem is it's there forever. All the little baby tomatoes also have the same gene. But that's not what we're doing in human gene therapy. In human gene therapy, what we're doing is we're making sure that the gene cannot get into the sperm or the eggs. We're treating the individual, not trying to change mankind. It's a very, very important distinction in terms of this technology. And so here's the safety record of gene therapy. There's, been, been, uh, there's actually hundreds of studies if you're interested in all the studies that have been done in gene therapy, you can go into the NIH. There's a website that has all the list of all the hundreds of gene therapy protocols that have been done. There are now 4,000 humans that have received gene therapy of one kind or another. Everything from fatal disorders, we've actually done gene therapy in normals just to look at the, the uh, responses to our vectors. And there has been this one tragic death at the University of Pennsylvania. 
But compared to other medicines, in fact, it's remarkably safe. And I think it's just going to take a while before the, the public begins to realize that. And it's, of course, our responsibility to, to talk about it. And, and so uh, there is public discourse. So the human example I want to show you is this problem. This is an angiogram that none of us want to have. This is an angiogram of an individual who has, here's the left anterior descending, the, the circumflex. And as you can see, it just sort of peters out. There is no place for our cardiac surgical colleagues to bypass. There is no place to do angioplasty. This individual has essentially end-stage disease. And our, my uh, colleagues and I started thinking about, keep in mind that the adenovirus will transiently express a gene. And we knew from the, the basic embryology had been done that the genes that are involved in terms of making new blood vessels are only transiently expressed. So we said, ah, can we make new blood vessels? Can we do a, if you will, a biological bypass uh, to treat this disease? So that's the concept. We're going to use therapeutic angiogenesis, the making of new blood vessels, to treat ischemic heart disease. And we're going to make an adenovirus. And with our vascular, as you see, the gene will be vascular endothelial growth factor. And we're going to put it in the heart. So that's the experiment. And now, to understand why we've done what we did, you have to understand a little bit about how you make new blood vessels when you're an embryo. And that's shown here. It starts in the mesoderm, and, and the mesoderm evolves into a mangioblast, which become our hemopoietic system. That's where our blood cells come from. But they also become our blood vessels. And that's a process the embryologists refer to as vasculogenesis. And initially, there's a primary capillary plexus that's made. And through the process of angiogenesis, you get a mature vascular bed with arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and, and so on. There are hundreds of genes involved in this process, most of which are not uh, well understood. But there clearly are certain genes that initiate the process. So I'll introduce you to a new term that, if this turns out to work, will become a, a group of drugs. And that's a term referred to as angiogens, that is, mediators that function to induce the process of angiogenesis, the making of new blood vessels. There are many different genes that do this, but there are two groups, that, two groups of genes that have been most uh, favored in terms of the studies. One is called the fibroblast growth factor group of genes. Uh, there is probably about 15 members of this. These are very potent genes, but they also stimulate other cells to proliferate, such as fibroblasts. And we were worried if we use those genes that there might be scar tissue in the heart, and that if we turned on the scar tissue genes, we'd make the scar worse. And so we turned to the vascular endothelial growth factor family. It's made in multiple spliced forms. It's very specific. We have to be a little careful of it because it can mediate vascular leak in very high, high, high doses. And so that's the gene that we'll use, vascular endothelial growth factor, or in the jargon, VEGF. Now, the way VEGF works is it interacts with the endothelial cells. Here's the basement membrane. Here's the endothelial cells. And what happens is the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels get activated. They break out. They, have, they migrate. They proliferate. They form tubes, because that's what blood vessels are, that forms networks, and it all gets connected up. But VEGF starts the process. And in fact, if, you don't, if you're a mouse and you knock out one of the two VEGF genes, it's, one of the, it's probably the only gene known only autosomal gene known, that if one of the two genes are knocked out in a mouse, the mouse does not survive embryogenesis. So you have to have both copies of this gene to make all your blood vessels to function normally. So let me show you it works. And first, I'm not going to show you not something not in the heart, but rather in the fat. And the reason we chose the fat is because fat has the lowest density of capillaries in the body. And we thought, if we could show that it works, so let's try to steer it so that um, uh, maybe rig the experiment so we could really see it. And so we thought, let's try to make new blood vessels in the fat where the background is low. And it turns out that in the rat, there is some fat behind the kidney. And so that was useful because we thought, <clears throat> if we transfer our adenovirus with the VEGF gene, and then we could do a laparotomy on the animal, when he's anesthetized, put him under a microscope and take a picture of the living blood vessels and the living fat. That was the idea. So we injected the adenovirus with the VEGF gene directly into the fat. We know that the body gets rid of the virus and the gene after a week. And now let's look one month later. So here's fat of a control rat. One month after administering uh, an adenovirus with a control gene, and as you can see, the fat has very little blood vessels. These red lines are the blood vessels. So that's the control. 
Compare that with a rat that one month previously we administered an adenovirus with the VEGF gene. And we see that. So you can see, we see well, no question when we make a lot of blood vessels, this is a little stitch we put into the skin. And you could say, well, those are big blood vessels because you can see them. What about histologically? So this is the, the microscopic view. And here's the fat. And these are the blood vessels in the fat. So that's the control. And compare that with the fat where one month previously we've administered adenovirus with the VEGF gene, and we see that, these blood vessels. So we were encouraged by that. And Todd Rosengard, as a cardiac surgeon, and I decided to move ahead and to do studies in larger animals. And the favorite animal for studies in, in cardiac ischemia is the pig, because it turns out the pig has the closest heart to the human heart. And so we put together an adenovirus with the VEGF gene. The idea is we're going to put it in the, in directly into the heart of a pig. And here is a very unhappy pig. And the pig is unhappy because we have put a constrictor, a metal constrictor, around the circumflex coronary artery. And the constrictor has, has a gel inside of it. And slowly over a period of a week, it'll constrict down. If you just tie off the coronary artery in a pig, the pig dies. So this is a model very similar to the human. So it's slowly developing. And then we put pacing wires on the, on, the, on the heart, and we can pace the pig when he's anesthetized at a couple hundred be beats a minute. So we have the heart really going, so it's like an exercising pig, but he's sleeping. And it brings out ischemia in that area. So it's very similar to the human, what happens in the, in the human. Three weeks later, you can see he's now very happy, we administer the adenovirus with VEGF directly to the heart and uh, to, to the pig. And then four weeks later, we evaluate using all the same methodology that we use, that we use uh, in humans, angiograms, echocardiography, nuclear medicine studies. All this was, was done in the pigs. Working in New York is not easy. You think New York's expensive. The hotel bill for a pig in the Upper East Side of New York is $20 a day. And Dr. Casalaro will laugh because when we were at NIH, we didn't have to pay for any of our animals, but I have to pay the hotel bill for the. I've often thought it might be cheaper to get a, uh, get a room at the plaza and just put all the pigs in one room. So let me just, I'll sh I want to show you the human data to finish. And, and so let me show you uh, one, just one, one example from the pig, and then I'll show you the human data. This is an angiogram of two pigs. The top pig is a control pig. One month previously had received a, a no virus. Both have ischemia in the heart because they had the coronary artery tied off. And this, the pig below is, is the treated pig. So up here, is a, this is an angiogram. Here is the constrictor. That's the metal sleeve. That's the catheter that we put in. And here's the left anterior descending coronary artery. That's fine. This area is the area supplied normally by the circumflex coronary artery. So it's completely black. There's no blood vessel because we tied off. Uh, the blood vessels. That's the control. And below is an animal that received the adenovirus with the VEGF. Here is the constrictor. There is the catheter. Here is the left anterior descending coronary artery. And now here is the circumflex. And we see complete filling of the circumflex. Not because it's getting its blood through the the, its normal uh, route, because we've tied it off. It's getting all of its blood supply through this complex uh, of vessels that are collaterals that have been developed because of the therapy. So we were encouraged by that. And uh, through the period of late 96 and early 97, we did a lot of safety studies. And we went to the Food and Drug Administration. And we asked them for permission to do studies. And they allowed us to move ahead to do it as an adjunct to cardiac bypass surgery. That is, patients who are on the pump getting their usual coronary artery uh, bypass. And we went into an area that wasn't being bypassed. We did 15 individuals. And the, data, the safety data was very, very good. And so we went back to the Food and Drug Administration and our local ethics uh, committee, and we said, what we want to do now is we want to take patients with severe coronary artery disease who have no other options, bring them to the hospital, and do general anesthesia, do a thoracotomy, that is, make a incision in the chest, and expose the heart and directly inject into the heart. And they allowed us to go ahead, and that's what I'll tell you about. So this is the uh, example of one of these patients. It's a very small incision that we do. The whole procedure takes about 30 minutes or so. And although all of this seems like very high-tech stuff, and it is, I guess the molecular biology is very high-tech. In fact, the way we deliver it is very low-tech. It's with an insulin syringe. And it's so low-tech. Now, I'm a pulmonary physician, as I, as I said. Here is Dr. Rosengart, who's the real cardiac surgeon. And here's me administering it to one of these patients. So if I can do it, I can assure you that anybody can do it. And it really is, is um, 
uh, something very simple to do. We can inject the heart. It takes about uh, three or four minutes to put about 30 small injections uh, within the, in the heart. And for those of you who, who um, sort of in, have the idea, the interest of, of what it's like to be a, a clinical investigator, Dr. Clasoaro knows this because he, he, he worked with us for several years. It's really an interesting experience as a physician to have that experience, to be standing in an operating room and you're doing it when we were doing this first patient and your hands on the heart and you're ejecting and you say, gee whiz, that was my idea. It's really sort of a neat kind of experience as a physician uh, to, to do that. And let me show you some of the preliminary data that we developed. First, of course, these patients have severe disease and so they have angina. Now this is sort of soft data because it's, it's uh, self-reported by the patients. <clears throat> and there's some placebo effects undoubtedly, but it's two groups of these patients, and here's their angina class, and so these are people that, you know, can barely get up out of their chair and, and walk across the room without getting angina. They're mostly class four, some are class three. This group we followed out for one year, this group to, for six months, and as you can see, all of them report decrease angina. It's interesting, one of our, I, I never talk about specifically any of our patients, but one of our patients has gone public with this, uh, that, and, and so I can talk about him. He is a major uh, editorial writer for Time Magazine. And he, totally unbeknownst to us, wrote an article in Time Magazine a year after he participated in our studies. And he said, I was, you know, I just basically couldn't do anything. And now, and there was a picture of him in Time Magazine playing squash. And so it's anecdotal, but it was sort of neat that uh, here's a guy that was, you know, at least believes he was really helped. Here are some of the, of, of this group of patients uh, that, this is their angiograms that are read blindly, and I'm showing you raw data because this is only a phase one study. This is their angiogram 30 days after we did the procedure compared to their angiogram beforehand. And the Rentrop score is a score of filling of the coronary arteries. So that we had three different observers, they were all blinded, and so this is the raw data. On the line is no change, below the line is worsening, and above the line is improvement. As you can see, the, the bulk of the data is above the line, and so that's very encouraging uh, for us. There's also nuclear medicine studies. This is in four of the patients, and, and these are Sestamibi studies. Sestamibi is injected, and, and it's taken up by the mitochondria. It's a measure of blood flow, and you exercise the individual, and you look at the uh, scans before and after exercise and subtract them by computer, and you're looking at the patient from their feet, and the heart has been collapsed on itself by the computer, and the area of whiteness is the bad area. That's the area of ischemia brought out by exercise. So more whiteness is bad. And this is before, and this is after. So you can see in this guy, there's a marked decrease in the area of whiteness, and you can see in this guy the same, and in this guy is about the, the same. So we're encouraged by that as well, that there seems to be an improvement in blood flow brought out by exercise. And finally, this is actually their exercise data. I mean, as you know, of course, with, with patients with coronary artery disease, the, probably the gold standard is how far they can walk on a treadmill. And so this is their treadmill time compared afterwards compared to before. This is over a period of a year. Dotted line is no change. And this is in minutes. So below the line is a worsening in the amount of time they can go on the treadmill. Above is improvement. And as you can see, interestingly, it's taken some time, but the group were followed out to a year all seem to have improvement in their exercise tolerance. And so we're very encouraged by this, and this has now moved into some phase two trials uh, that are, are going on. Also the studies that have been started by instead of doing car surgery is to use a catheter to put the catheter to down into the left ventricle and inject it directly into the inside wall of the heart uh, as another strategy for delivering, and all of these studies are, are ongoing. So in summary, then, uh, the idea is new genes for old hearts, and, and I hope it convinced you at least it's, it's interesting and encouraging. And to, to really summarize, I don't know whether all this is sort of Ponce de Leon stuff, but the idea of genetic medicine, I think, is, is, is there's no question about it. When you think about the, the idea that we have the 100,000 knowledge now of the 100,000 genes that make us up as humans, and we have that knowledge now and we can get those genes, and we have the technology now to deliver those genes directly to essentially any organ in the body, and we have the technology where we know we can express those genes. What I think we're going to see over the next decade are the evolution of this as a part of medicine 
And I think the genetic medicine, you're going to have doctors within the next decade walking around your hospital who are genetic medicine doctors to administer genes to treat not only coronary artery disease, but uh, a variety of disorders. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm honored to be here. Okay. All right. I have to turn this off. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If, if. First question is always the toughest. <laughs> well, I, my question is, uh, it seems that you could, you're, you may have the opportunity to run a sub three hour marathon. If you could inject, use angiogenesis into your muscles, mm -hmm. the potential, you must have thought of this. I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually also, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure having been in the Olympic Village, you know all about erythropoietin. Um, erythropoietin, the, the way that the erythropoietin is detected, the recombinant erythropoietin is detected is because it's made in, um, in, in cells that put different carbohydrates on the side chain. So you do isoelectric focusing, and you can, that, that's how you can detect it. In fact, those of you interested in, in actually the article was in Nature, and uh, there, there's actual examples of uh, the guys who were in uh, the Tour de France two years ago, with, with, uh, who were who booted out of the Tour de France, and examples of their urine. Uh, the, um, we've certainly thought about erythropoietin as well, and we have adenovirus gene transfer vectors, and I, I didn't bring along the data, but I could show you that I can raise the hematocrit, uh, the blood level, in a, in a mouse or a rat very dramatically, and I can assure you this could not be detected. Did you just say something about side effects of gene therapy? Well, there's two, two kinds of, well, there's three, three kinds of side effects. One is the procedure itself, you know, like anything in medicine. The second is the gene. In other words, what if we give too much of the VEGF and you've got a hemangioma? So if you give, like any drug, you give too much aspirin, you end up in the emergency room. So the gene dose is, is relevant. The third area, and the thing that was responsible for the death at the University of Pennsylvania, is the vector itself. I mean, after all, there are host responses to these viruses. And if you use too much, the host responses may be, may be, uh, uh, could be lethal. Now, the, at the University of Pennsylvania, the case was a, a young man who had a rare genetic disease. It wasn't in the papers as much that, in fact, it, it, he had had some comas and was close to death a few times. And he got a dose about thousandfold higher than we're using in, in these studies. So you can think of gene therapy in the same way that you think of any drug. You know, if you, if you give too much of any drug, you have all kinds of adverse toxicities. It's the same as in gene, gene therapy. Uh, so those are, the, those are basically the adverse events uh, that you might expect. And each of the viruses are different in the kinds of toxicities you might expect, just like any kind of drug. Is it extremely necessary to do a thoracotomy compared to by ultrasound guidance? Well, the reason we did a thoracotomy was because it was the first time and we were trying to minimize the variables. You know, we thought it would just be easier. Of course, I was doing a cardiac surgeon. For those cardiac surgeons, it's easy. Uh, and so we thought about a variety of strategies. We wanted to make sure we got it to the right place. We, the next step, we think, is catheter delivery. And we and others have worked out strategies with catheters. And we can very effectively deliver it. Uh, through, so it's a typical cardiac catheterization, which essentially, you know, been an outpatient procedure. And those studies are now ongoing. I think also um, a percutaneous, just going directly in, might be a possibility. It's a, there's, it's a little complex because of the, the, where the heart is and getting around to the whole free wall, the left ventricle, is a, is a bit of a challenge. And actually, we, we've developed a, a, a little device, sort of a telescope kind of device, that might allow us to do that, that sort of curve. This is a follow-up question. Um, you're talking about a lot of different ways to go ahead and deliver the um, vector to the tissue. Do you think in the future you may actually be able to deliver it intravenously and have a particular way of having the vector find the target tissue yeah. of interest? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we and others are working on it. And the, and, and, um, the, the jargon of the field, those are targeted vectors. And, and the strategy is, of course, different tissues, the cells have different receptors. And so by having a different receptor, if we can modify the viruses 
to only want to go to one receptor, we could do that. So the way we're, we, we're trying to do that is think of that the adenovirus has little spikes coming out. So we genetically modify the spikes so it can't go into the receptor it usually uses, and then we put whatever ligand for the specific receptor. That's the idea. Now, whether that will ever work or not, I don't know, but that's the basic the strategy. Is there. There's another challenge, though, and that is, let's say you're trying to put it in the brain. You know, the problem is that, of course, if you do it intravenously, you have the vasculature and you have endothelial cells. So you've got to somehow get past the endothelium. In an organ like the liver that's fenestrated endothelium, that's easy. But in, in the brain, the heart, and so on, that's a lot tougher. So that's the other challenge. I have a quick question as well. Um, when you're using a a virus such as an adenovirus for the vector, it's a virus to which many of us have been exposed. Um, have you considered using other viruses to which we have not been exposed to see if you could get a more, a bit more of an effect with your genes? Well, uh, there's two aspects of that. Um, the, the, when we did the first human experiment with a virus, uh, we, this was an individual cystic fibrosis that we did in April of 93 at NIH. And one of the things we were worried about, and the FDA was worried about, is what if our virus recombined with some virus within the individual, and we caused an Andromeda-type virus that wiped out DC? And that was the worry. And so we built at NIH, uh, that was just before I left, we built three rooms that were negative pressure rooms so that viruses couldn't get out. And the poor guy was our first individual. He was in that room for six weeks because it was like the Neil Armstrong coming back from the moon. And the FDA, and we were worried about it, so we were taking cultures all the time. It turned out to be nothing. We now do it as outpatients. You know, it's no risk uh, at, at all. Now, the, in terms of the issue of immunity, that is a significant issue. And if you think of it, it's sort of a race between the, putting the, the, the virus with the gene. If you have antibodies, we've got to get it to the tissue before the antibodies get to us, or get to the virus. And once it gets in the cell, then it doesn't matter what the immune system does, or at least the antibodies. And so we might be able to overpower it. The other strategy is to use different serotypes of virus. So if somebody sneezes on you and get a cold with, you know, with type 5 adenovirus, maybe we can do it with type 13 or 14 adenovirus. That's another strategy to do. And another strategy is to use stealth viruses where we engineer them so that the immune system can't see them. That would be worse if you have problems, you know, recombination. But those are the strategies that are being thought of. What's the longevity of the, um, the effect, like with the mouse? I mean, does the hair still grow faster than other areas, or...? Yeah, that's a good question. Hey, what, what, yeah, do you have really long hair? No, what happens is, the, the, as far as we can tell, it's a transient effect. It gives sort of a boost to the, 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 the follicles. They start growing, and then the rest of the, the, the hair follicles catch up. Yeah, so, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It's been, it's been suggested to, I mean, I, I, believe me, this has gotten a lot of attention, as you, you see. I mean, I've had investors come to me and say, look, just forget about the FDA. We'll get a boat, and we'll put it offshore, and just put an ad in, in the Times. And, <laughs> right. They will come. What's the status of FDA? Elevation. For? Genetic. For? Oh, yes. Well, th there is a lot of interest uh, in terms of genetic. And the question is, for genetic engineering in terms of uh, lipoproteins, and, and can you manipulate the lipoprotein for all, so we can all eat hamburgers? Um, the, the, uh, there actually have been human studies now that, that uh, have been done, particularly for the familial form of hypercholesterolemia, because there the kids have such high cholesterol levels they get heart attacks, you know, when they're 13 and 15 years old. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work going on. There's nothing been proven in terms of making it work. The problem there is you have to transfer the gene to the liver, and although that's a good place, uh, there's some technical problems with doing that and getting long-term expression. But there's a lot of groups that are very, very interested in that and working very hard in that, and I think you'll see that as a reality within the next decade. Meanwhile, I'll take your Lipitor. <laughs> Dr. Crystal, it's, neat. it's uh, not necessary to say how you held your audience and your tremendous knowledge of the subject, and we really appreciate 
And uh, don't worry that being number 13 has no adverse <laughs> effect. Uh, John Dolan has a presentation for you. Doctor, on behalf of my mother and the Dolan family, I want to thank you. Uh, I think I understood it. We like the little houses. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of my father and uh, a memento of this. Well, thank you, Amon. Thank, thank you very much. The uh, staff has been working very diligently to provide uh, some refreshments, so please enjoy. And every one of you promised to come back next year. Here? Thank you.